So, good evening, uh, thank you very much for still being here. Uh, welcome to this insight into the science behind truth and deception detection, and in other words, in lie detection. This subject became a bit cool or sexy after the uh, series Lie to Me was released. Who knows the series? So that's not bad, thank you. Uh, in the pilot series, Ria Torres, a new recruit, was asked by Cal Lightman, who is the kind of leader, uh, if she had ever received special training in deception detection because of her level, uh, her capacity to detect lies in others. And her answer was, I've dated a lot of men. In my case, I did not date that many women, but I had a few bosses, some were more honest than others. And at some stage, it gave me the will to understand a bit more about what was going on behind uh, deception detection. So, let me ask you uh, a question. Have you ever thought that somebody was lying to you? Have you been uh, certain that somebody was lying to you? Early on today, we were discussing about somebody who had a daughter, of course, you know, who is coming and saying, ah, tonight, mom, can I sleep? with a friend, of course, that's a lady friend. And we know that it's not always the case, but we want to be sure about that, we want to have more evidence. And before going further, I want to give you definition of what we mean by lie and what we mean by truth. If you go to see a magician, a spectacle, do you expect that person to tell you everything, to give you everything which is true? Of course not. You expect some tricks to be there, but you expect to relax and dream about it. Now, if you are voting to a politician, or if you are working for a leader, of course you would assume that person to be completely honest with you. Maybe that's a wrong example. But at least, I'm not gonna comment about Belgium, uh, but at least if you hire somebody, there's a lot of people here about HR, if you hire somebody, you would expect the person you hire to be the one that's gonna work there, which is the same profile. But it could happen that it's not the case. Let me show you some figures that may interest some people either in HR or now because they've been graduated who want to apply. Uh, these figures were released just early this week, so that's quite fresh. 24% of employees were found to have lied about the reason for their leave application, for example. And it starts from, I'm sick, or a parent is at the hospital. Now, another one. Statistics that came from the CIPD, which is in the UK. 39% of UK organizations have allowed recruitment of employees that are found to have lied in the application. So it means those people went through the process the reasons or the distortion, if you want, of the reality were from uh, level of the previous qualification, school qualification, and for example, of course, salary. The CIPD determined that the cost of not picking up deception job application can cost employers between 4,700 up to 7,000 euros per mistake. This is quite a lot of money. Now, you're gonna tell me this only happens to junior employee. Now, I've got the question for you. Who lied on his resume and became the CEO of an internet worldwide known company not so long ago? Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much for your contribution. Yahoo yeah, CEO. So it does not only happen to junior. Now, for the people who will remember out a bit of HR and more in the kind of strong business we're talking about startup and so on, What corporation did Fortune magazine list as an American most innovative company six years in a row? Again, for those who will remember, Enron. I had friends losing a lot of money with that. So deception can cost millions. And why am I saying that? Because when we talk about uh, deception detection, i.e. lie detection, and about lie to me, a lot of people think it's a kind of hobby. You do that for fun, you know, like on the... Sunday afternoon with your friend. No, this is serious business. Now talking about security. 
think about security. Police officers face daily people who are trying to escape from you know, the, the rules. They are trying to avoid being caught at whatever. Knowing that, and this is a quite known figure, do you know the average deception detection capacity of everybody like in this room? Sorry? 56? Nearly. 54%. 54%, i.e. one of two, you'd rather take a coin and flip it. This is no more than this. So with that in mind, think about border control, homeland security. Those people, like customs officers, they see hundreds, thousands of people per day going in front of them, and their level is only 54%. What if, what if, Someone representing a potential threat to our welfare would sneak in. What if? The issue is that we know the answer. So again, yes, deception detection is a business. This is serious business. So can we do any better? Yes. And because I'm optimistic too, so thank you very much, I'm certain we can do better. So my answer is, yes, we can. So then comes the how. How can we do any better? There are a lot of myths, and we won't have the time here to discuss everything, because the, the subject is too wide, about the myths behind lie detection. But a good one that I really love, and when normally I have conferences, people ask me or tell me, uh, like, when I've got a kid, I will ask him, look at me straight in the eyes and tell me the truth. Unfortunately. That's a myth. That doesn't work. Often, when people are lying to you, they will look at you straight in the face because they want to see how you react. They want to see if you buy into the lie or not. So if you buy into it, they will just, hmm, good. And if you don't go, hmm, I don't believe in you, they will change slightly the story until the point that you believe in them. So that's a myth. So here we're going to talk about science. So to talk about the how, I want to talk about the who first. And to talk about the who, I want to talk about Paul Ekman. So Paul Ekman, and Link to Lie to Me, is the scientist who was consultant to the series Lie to Me. He is a professor of psychology, he's a psychologist himself. Um, he was one of the pioneers in uh, regard to the link between the emotion and the facial expression and the universality of the facial expression. Uh, he is also a consultant to the FBI, the CIA, and early on we were talking about Pixar. He's also a consultant to Pixar. If you want to talk about him, we need to talk about him a few years back when he was much younger. That's still the same guy. And he did not go to the North Pole. He went to Papua New Guinea. Why did he go there? Because he was doing some cross-cultural uh, research. And he wanted to find some people who had not been influenced by our culture. And he went there. And what he discovered is that those people could recognize pictures of like European people and interpret their facial expression in terms of emotion. And even better than this, he could, they could tell him a story and those people could image what they were feeling. And through this, we realized that those emotions were universal. I'll come back to it. So this is a true picture of that period of the face of the people who were told those stories. One of the stories, last, what, I saw a smelly dead pig, and you can see here a facial expression of disgust. Second was, a child had died. You can see sadness, and some universal elements are the upper eyebrows are raised up, for example. Another story was, friend had come. You can see a true smile here, and also what we call the crow's feet over there. And one of the other story was, you are about to fight so the people could display anger. And you can see the eyebrows pulled down and together. So again, through this experiment, he was able to prove to the science that those emotions and the way to expre uh, express them sorry, through the face are universal. So wherever you are here in Montreal, in Africa or in the North Pole, this same expression will be found on people's face depending on some of those emotions. And those emotions 
were seven. So there are seven universal emotions. Happiness, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, surprise, and contempt. Just for the people who are interested in contempt in particular, because some people will say, no, that's not an emotion, or that's not universal. So contempt can be represented. It's, it's only on one part of the face. And what you will have is you will have one part of the lips that goes up or down, but often it's up. And the feeling is like a, sen a, sen uh, yeah, a feeling of superiority towards somebody. So that's... Mm. Now, from now, uh, yeah, apparently it speaks to you. When you will go out, look around you, and you will see that happening often. Daily, day in, day out, on the face of the people. So yes, this is universal too. So again, we are talking here about science knowledge on how to spot deception. Again, there is a lot of literature, but here it's science. So now that we know that first it is important to our welfare and to the business, and this is based on science, so how does it work? When we're telling the truth, we've got two main areas in our body, the emotional part and the cognitive part. And they work together in harmony. Everything goes okay. So what you are feeling and what you are thinking at the same time goes hand in hand. And they create some spontaneity. You've got a kind of constant flow, a magic flow. If I ask you something like, do you really want this job? Normally you should say yes. If it takes more than two seconds to say yes, it, there is something wrong about it. So that's good for the HR people. If the person hesitates to say something, maybe that person doesn't really want the job. Maybe it's just to pay the mortgage. Maybe he's got another one, you know, lined up. But it's worth investigating it. Now, that was truth. What does happen if you are telling a lie? When we are lying, those two domains, the cognitive thinking domain and the emotional uh, feeling domain, start to work against each other. They are fighting for resources because what you are feeling and what you are saying, for example, and therefore thinking, would be different. So they start to fight to each other. You could be, for example, saying something to a loved one. And at the moment you are saying that lie to the loved one, you start to feel guilt or shame. And at that moment, because it's fighting for resources, mostly there will be what we call a leakage. A leakage, it's a kind of clue, something that will be given off what we call technically a hotspot. A hotspot will be given. Again, a hotspot is not a lie. It's an indication that something is happening and it needs to be further investigated. That hotspot will be given off through five channels. First channel is the facial expression. We just mentioned it, I will come back to it. Second one is body language. Third one is the voice. The voice is the RSVP, rhythm, speed, volume, pitch. The verbal content is the hesitation, the ums and the ahs in the discussion. And the last one are the verbal content in itself, it's the word being used. So like a liar will avoid to use I, me, and my, and will use more don't, won't count, for example. Also, they will use more distensive languages, uh, such as instead of, for example, saying the name of somebody, that person will speak about he or she to put some distance in between. But sorry, there's no single indicator of deception. In other words, no Pinocchio knows. Will the people remember that? If you see an indicator, so a hotspot through one of the channels, you cannot conclude, like a bit in the series, that that person is lying. No, there's a hotspot. It needs to be investigated, but do not jump too fast to conclusion, please. Coming back on that channel, channel number one, the face, because that was the one that was conveyed mainly through the series. So here, that was the picture taken in Papua New Guinea. This is the picture of Paul Ekman doing the same thing. You've got anger with the uh, eyebrows down and uh, together, and also the mouse cloud, the, sorry, the mouse rolled in. Facial expression, again, uh, you've got about 40 muscles in the face, 43 exactly, representing something like 10,000 mimics, and they provide 
accurate information on your emotional and cognitive status. They provide you information. If you try to conceal some of the information, again, that might leak out in what we call a uh, micro-expression, which will last less than a fifth of a second, even down to a 25th of a second. Micro-expression, they represent repressed emotion and deliberately concealed emotion, i.e., People don't want to feel something or they don't want you to know what they're feeling. Again, they do not reveal the trigger nor the target. So if you spot on somebody's face a micro expression, you do not know if he's trying to uh, lie at you or something. It just could be something going in their mind. Those five channels need to be scanned all the time and it takes a lot of energy. So to do that, you need strategy and tactic and that's why even in the movie, it seems to be simple. It's very time-consuming, energy-consuming, and it requires a lot of practice and uh, skills. But with good training, people can go up to 90% deception detection on root science. So it's a major improvement. So again, 54% up to 90% with adequate training. Now. Let me show you what it can give in real, re real life. All right, and now two TSA agents at Miami Airport rescued a woman from two kidnappers as she was checking in for her flight. Now, let's just show you the surveillance video. This was an incident that happened on July 5th. And uh, basically, uh, as you can see, because we're zoning in on exactly what you should watch, there, there were behavior detection officers for the TSA, and they spotted a 25-year-old woman who was trembling. Apparently, uh, uh, she was trying to hide facial injuries uh, at a ticket counter. After separating her from her travel companions, uh, they learned that she had been beaten. She said she was being held against her will. Out front tonight, Mark Hatfield. He's the TSA Federal Security Director for Miami International Airport. Mark, thanks for coming out front and appreciate your taking the time. So um, who are these behavior thanks, detection agents? How did they pick this woman out? Um, there's a lot of people who look upset, disturbed, uh, you know, nervous going through security. Well, you know, one could argue that the uh, stressful environment of an airport uh, can cause that in a lot of people. But what they're trained to do, and, and they do receive a very uh, uh, rigorous training uh, protocol before they get certified to do this, uh, this job, is they look for indicators, both voluntary actions, involuntary actions, facial uh, gestures, facial motions, and a wide variety of body language, if you will, as they practice this behavior detection science. And in, in this case, there was a uh, a, a rather overt uh, initial indicator. The woman, was, as you said, was trying to hide her face, which seemed a bit odd. They watched her a little bit longer, and as it progressed, um, huh. the, uh, the point value of her situation increased pretty rapidly, and uh, it wasn't long before they called in local law enforcement, and uh, the rest is in the police reports. Have you, you know, busted, for lack of a better word, this sort of thing before? Well, this is the first kidnapping uh, that has been thwarted in, uh, in, in this uh, in this airport and, and across the country as far as I know. TSA officers, the behavior detection officers, have a very defined job. They have a narrow focus and the way the program is structured when it gets to a certain level where either a uh, crime is possibly being committed or even worse if it is uh, an act of terror, uh, we partner very closely with local law enforcement agencies across the country. It's a very successful model that we've developed over the last 10 years. So those detection officers are trained on those methods. So to me, the future is ahead. And as you can see now, the training are available and have been released. So now that science, which was only for CIA and FBI, is now available to all. So thank you very much for your attention.